um, when we were talking about our event on the 6th, a month ago or so, um, Jennifer came up to John and I and said, you know, if the space at the Briscoe Pavilion is open, we'd love to host the party for y'all um, for the big gift. So that has all, I'm happy to say, come together. And we really appreciate their hospitality and donating that space to us. It's going to be a great event. We're still in the process of you know, buttoning down food trucks and cash bar and donation laptops um, throughout the bottom of the pavilion and, and outside. So we'll um, be announcing that and you'll see invitations very soon about the Big Give Party. And then Jennifer mentioned to John and I that she had participated in the first giving event in Austin, the Amplify Austin at an agency there. And of course, you know, I was like, wow, you know, would you be interested in like sharing your experience with our first timers in San Antonio? And she agreed to do that. And I think that is very generous and it really is going to be real helpful for y'all. And that's why I think this workshop of all of them is going to be um, the most important to you because it's, it's someone who's experienced this firsthand. So without any further um, explanation, I'm going to introduce Jennifer Wachenko from the Briscoe Western Art Museum. Okay, I'll just make sure. Can y'all hear me okay? Great. Well, thanks so much for coming out. I know it's Monday morning. This isn't the best time slot to get your day started with development workshop. But um, and the Oscars were last night, and they ran long, and it's so cold today. I don't know what's going on. So thank you for being here. So we'll try and keep it lively. I'm not going to talk the whole time. I know it's mostly probably people have questions. So we will um, get to that part. But um, first of all, because I have to do the shameless plug for the museum, how many of you have been to the Briscoe Western Art Museum? All right. Um, now, how many of you have actually been to the museum, not just because, of course, we have this beautiful event space in the Jack Genther Pavilion where we're going to have the big give event, but how many you have been to the museum part? Yes? Okay, great. Well, uh, we just opened October 26th. We're located right on the Riverwalk at the corner of Market and Presses Street. We are in the building that used to be San Antonio's uh, first central library from 1930 to 1968. So I would very much encourage you to come visit. Um, it's a beautiful space, brand new. It's a different experience, I think, than what you, that people expect in an art museum. Um, and we have very low admission price for only $5 for adults, $4 for children, uh, or excuse me, students, military, and seniors, and then children 12 and under for free. So please come by. And very, ex uh, very excited to share that, uh, as Scott mentioned, we are going to host the Big Give event on May 6th in the Jack Genther Pavilion. And because it's a great day for San Antonio, um, and it's the first Tuesday of the month, the museum will be open late till 9 p.m. that day, and we're going to make it free admission um, just because it's the big give. So I will definitely see everyone on May 6th. So why am I here? Well, I love micro-giving, or crowdfunding, or however you want to call it. Um, the, this whole concept of getting lots of people to give you dollars, usually at a lower price point. And the reason why, because it's very democratic, it's accessible, it's a low cost option, there's no big expensive direct mail out that you have to do. Um, usually these are time based, so it's for a certain period of time, in this case only 24 hours. That sense of ur urgency um, works in your favor. And then um, it's a great way to get new donors um, because the, the entry point is so low. So people are like, okay, well, I can give $10. Um, you know, personally as a fundraiser, and I'm sure a lot of my fellow fundraisers in the room share this, this feeling, is that um, we don't ascribe to the fact that only philanthropists can only be rich people, right? Anybody can be a philanthropist. Anyone can donate. And so these type of micro-giving campaigns or crowdfunding um, campaigns are just, I think, I think they're the wave of the future. So how many people have participated in a campaign like this, like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, or done your own? Yeah, so um, I think this is a great idea, and I was really excited. I moved here last year from Austin, and was really excited to find out that San Antonio will be doing uh, its first one on May 6th. So just a little bit of background and to, to my experience with this. So in 2010, I worked at an institution called the Art House at the Jones Center. Um, it merged with Austin Museum of Art. It's now called the Contemporary Austin. But in um, 2010, the building right at 7th and Congress was under renovation. 
So we were closed for a whole year. And I had this crazy idea to have a micro giving campaign as a way to stay engaged with our constituents while the museum was not open and we didn't have a lot of programming. And so um, we did it in the month of February around Valentine's Day and came up with the cute name, I, I Heart Art House. We did it for one month and it was an experiment, but I think it was a successful one. And we had 279 donors, 184 were first time, and we raised about $3,500. So again, it's, it wasn't about um, raising tons of dollars, it was about getting people um, involved and keeping them connected. And those 184 new donors were, of course, um, great for us for when we were gonna start pushing membership once the museum opened. Um, and I believe donations started at five or $10. So again, low entry point. So then two years later, I was at Leadership Austin and wanted to do it again because it was so much fun. It was leap year. So again, in February, we did this uh, campaign called Leap Together, Lead Together. We actually did have a really clever logo, but I couldn't find it. Um, and this time, having learned that one month was just too long. You'll get a lot of donors right at, at the beginning, and then it trails off, and, and then it gets kind of annoying that you're emailing people all the time, have you given yet, have you given yet? So we condensed it to two weeks. Um, we got 121 donors. Leadership Austin is a, a little bit of a different model. Um, but again, raised $2,700. So then in 2013 was the first year that Austin did a 24-hour giving day in Amplify Austin. Um, the citywide goal was a million dollars, uh, raised about 2.8 that day. It was March of last year. It's coming up soon on March 20th um, in a couple weeks. And um, you, know, you only have 24 hours, so you gotta hit it hard, but we got 380 gifts and in total raised $30,000 because 24,000 was donated and then there were all these booster prizes and we made a strategy to win some of those and got an additional $6,000. So incredibly successful. So why do I tell you all this? It's not to brag, oh, I've done this so many times. It's, it's to show that together we're more successful. So I think there's no better example in fundraising that a rising tides lift all boats, right? Because we had probably about the same 200 something nonprofits that participated in Amplify last year. And, um, you know, we didn't, we uh, weren't even at the top. I mean, I don't even know. We were probably about 16 um, in terms of rankings. But I mean, some people raised a ton of money and nonprofits of all sizes, which if you went to the first um, big give um, workshop, then you, you heard those um, stories of some of the really smaller nonprofits that really benefited. Again, for those, those reasons I said on the first slide, that it's a low cost way, um, it's something that can be done by a, a nonprofits of any size. So just before I go into kind of these steps, if, if there's ever a point when you have a question, again, we'll have plenty of time at the end, but feel, feel free to just raise your hand and stop me. Yes, mics on either side. All right, so how to get going. Um, I just outlined these steps and I'm, I'm sure there's probably a way for us to share the presentation later um, so you don't have to worry too much about writing everything down. Um, so step one, you know, evaluate your situation. Two, assess your current donor base. Three, set a goal and a fundraising strategy. Four, map out a communication plan. Five, the day of, raise lots of money. And then step six, thank your donors. So I know there's probably tons of fundraisers in the room. Um, you'll notice this is no different than the, what we all know is the fundraising cycle. It just happens in a more compact time frame. So first step, um, and this is probably the most important, you know, we're, what is today, March 3rd, so we're two months out. Um, the first step is to assess your current situation and how does the big give fit within your current development plan? So um, I still sit on the board of an arts organization in Austin called Forklift Dance Works. And last year, Amplify came around and our executive director asked me, um, well, what should we do for it? Should we participate? And I said, no, <laughs> frankly. Um, I said, we can sign up, we can be on the list, but we had already planned, we had a performance coming up in July and we had already planned to do a major Kickstarter um, 
that was going to be a $30,000 goal um, for March. And it just didn't make sense because you can't go on March 2nd or whatever day that was, March 5th of last year, ask your donors, you know, push them hard to give to Amplify Austin, and then two weeks later turn around and say, oh, but we have this really important Kickstarter and we need you to donate to that too. So it needs to make sense um, within what you're already doing. Now, um, you know, knowing what you know now, you can plan for the next year. So, and, and actually with Forklift Dance Works, we are gonna participate in Amplify Austin this year because we knew when it was coming, we were able to build it into our current development plan for the year. Step two, assess your current donors. So this is one that I'm still uh, working on at, at the Briscoe Museum, is you know, how tech savvy are your donors? What kind of donors do you have? We're very fortunate at the museum that we have um, a good amount of large dollar donors. So we don't um, necessarily have um, you know, very different from, from the other organizations I worked for. And how do you communicate with them? Do you send out um, regular email blasts? Or do you have good interaction with them over social media? I know that they, you just had the social media workshop um, a couple weeks ago. And then how do they donate? Do people send you checks? Do they um, go online and donate? Do you have people, I, I think it varies by sector, um, by size of nonprofit, but those are things to consider because, of course, this is only online and it's only within 24 hours. So you have to think about how you can activate the donors you have to give in that short period of time. And, and basically, you have one option of how to do it. So the next step is to set a goal. You, you definitely need a goal. You don't want to just go in blindly and say, we're going to just raise some money on May 6th. Um, you want something to work towards. So just like anything, when you're going to make an ask, you don't want to ask too high, but you don't want to ask too low. You want to find that, that right point. But I think um, what campaigns like this offer that's unique is that you don't have to think just in terms of total dollars raised. You can think about how many donors do you want to get. So again, given, going back to that example of Forklift Dance Works in, in Austin for Amplify, we're actually going to say we want to get 100 donors on that day. So that's something to consider. And that's a goal that um, I've used before with other nonprofits, is to think of it in terms of number of donors. Because again, it's about, really about engagement um, in addition to how much money And then once you've set your goal, you want to think about how you get there. So um, I'm not familiar yet with, with I know there are going to be booster prizes throughout the day. But um, for example, with Amplify, there was every hour was um, a prize for the nonprofit that raised the most dollars that hour and then had the most donors within that hour. Um, so there were 48 of those total. Um, and then we, the prize that we were going for at Leadership Austin was the most individual fundraising pages. So I'm not sure if we're going to do that here, but for example, just so you can think of, um, to give you an example of how to develop a strategy. Um, so we know when you do a, a walk or, or a, a, like a Race for the Cure or the MS walk and you are a participant and you sign up and you have your own fundraising page. Well, they did that. Um, and what we thought with Leadership Austin, has anyone been through Leadership San Antonio or any of these leadership programs? So, um, you know, classes tend to be very competitive against one another. Every year they think they're the best class ever. And so we use that to our advantage to see, okay, who really is the best class ever and pitted the classes against one another. So that competition, again, assessing the donors that we had really worked in our favor um, because each class had its own fundraising page and then we're able to compete. And because we had so many of those pages, we were able to get a $5,000 prize. So take a look at what's available to you. Maybe because of the nature of your nonprofit, your constituents are up at 2 in the morning. And that may be a slow time um, within the 24-hour period for people to donate. So maybe you can go for that prize for that hour. Um, this is something I, I really want to try and pursue is getting a matched gift. You know, would your board be willing to say, okay, we will, as a board, collectively match up to $10,000 of whatever's raised on May 6th? I think 
that's a great incentive. Uh, I know it would work for me if I was thinking about this nonprofit. I'm like, wow, I give my 20 bucks, and then someone else is going to give 20 on top of that. So that's something, and of course, that's something to work on now, and then make sure you uh, publicize that to all of your constituents. And then lastly, make sure you arm your staff and your board with a toolkit. So not just the board, um, but you know, give them, say, make sure you give them a briefing on this is what, what is happening on May 6th. We are participating. Um, here are, here's a sample email that you can send out to all of your contacts about the Briscoe Western Art Museum participating and how they can donate to the museum. Um, here are some, maybe not for our board, but um, here's our staff for, here are some sample Facebook updates that you can post or um, Twitter updates. So give them the resources they need to work on your behalf. And you want to encourage, too, uh, 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 speaking of goals, try and get you know, your board to participate, um, all of them. It doesn't matter about the amount that they donate on that day, but try and get them to make a donation of some sort. So I was very proud at Leadership Austin. Every single one of the staff participated. I didn't ask, but they all gave. And then all but one pesky board member donated on that day. So um, <laughs> we'll be talking to our board this year. Step four, map out a communication plan. So how active, um, raise your hands if your, your organization is very active on Facebook and Twitter. Yeah? OK, for all of you who didn't, time to get going. <laughs> um, because you don't want to make, wait till May 2nd saying, hey, the big give's coming up in two days. You've never heard about us on Twitter or even seen a Facebook update, but we want you to give to us on that day. It's, it's going to be too late. So now's the time. Um, you want to start building up your followers because, again, because this is only 24 hours. It's a very short time frame. Um, and believe me, all the people here in this room and then all the nonprofits that aren't in this room are all going to be posting wildly on their social media networks about um, the big give, and you want to make sure that you're, some, so to speak, in the pipeline. So now's the time to start building up your social media um, followers. I would recommend three to four weeks out. Um, I'm starting to get the emails from all the nonprofits in Austin about it. Um, to send an email to your database saying, hey, you may have heard about the big give. Let me quickly tell you what it is. By the way, we're participating. And you don't want to say, make sure you give to us only. Because the great thing about these days, as you've heard before from John and Scott, is that people tend to give to multiple organizations. So you want to tell them, we hope that you'll consider our nonprofit to be on your list on the day. And then you've got to remind people one to two weeks out, and then the day before saying it's coming, um, you know, on f at four o'clock on Monday, May 5th, you know, at midnight you can start making your donation, and you want to make it as easy as possible, direct link, uh, make sure if there's, I, I haven't been on the page yet, I know they're use, using the same system that was used in Amplify. But make sure you give them specific directions on how to find you so that they know to give to your nonprofit. And um, then get ready, because this is important here. With anything else, is, is you got to tell people why should they give to you. Not just because it's the big give and it's cool, but of course, you got to tie it back to your mission. You got to say, you're going to, you know, we want you to donate to us on May 6th because we're going to use those dollars to do X. So again, this is no different than any other fundraising campaign. It's just a different mechanism. There we go. Bonus step, rest up. <laughs> because once the day comes and um, Amplify runs from evening to evening. So you get really excited for it to launch. And it is exciting because you can watch the leaderboards. And that's what I did most of the day. And, and you see the, the, the gifts start coming in. And you're, like, it's really exciting. And you're texting with your you know, fellow staff. It's like, oh my gosh, look, someone just gave us word $2,000 already. Um, and it's addicting. And you can't stop watching the leaderboards. So make sure you get some rest on Sunday um, so that you can be ready at midnight on May 6th for a uh, whirlwind 24 hours. And then step five, raise lots of money. So you want to make sure to stay in touch with your constituents throughout the day. So 
Maybe when you hit the $1,000 mark, you send an email blast to your database and say, hey, we hit $1,000, you're doing great, make sure that you tell all your friends. If you've already donated, you know, post this update to Twitter or Facebook telling them that you donated with a link to how to donate, um, for those people to donate to us. So you gotta um, keep them informed and you know, so I, I know that I did periodic email blasts, you know, the after, before the, I think before midnight in the morning is an update on how we were doing in the mid-afternoon saying this is the final push, let's do it. Um, again, if you've set your fundraising goal, you want to tell them how you're doing according to your goals. So, you know, if you set a goal of 100 donors, okay, we're at 75 donors, we're getting really close, let's find 25 more people to donate. Um, Frequent Facebook updates and Twitter posts, that's the beauty of social media, is it doesn't last forever. Um, people are used to getting bombarded with that stuff, so it's okay to, to be uh, very active. And then interact with your followers. So um, thanks so much to John Smith, you know, and tag him on Facebook or on Twitter for donating $100, you know, who's next? So, um, I don't know if, if y'all discussed that at the social media workshop, but it's a good idea to use some kind of social media managing tool like TweetDeck or Hoot, we use HootSuite, because um, then you can schedule your tweets and your updates throughout the day so you're not just on Twitter and Facebook all day on May 6th. And then once it's all done and you've gotten a good night's sleep, then um, make sure you thank your donors. So you'll get, um, the San Antonio Area Foundation will send the official gift acknowledgement out to everybody, but you're gonna get a list of all of your donors with their contact information, um, how much they donated, and you need to send them a thank you too. It doesn't have to be the official tax receipt, but just tell them thanks so much for t participating on that day. And, and as we all know, the big gift happens once a year, but we don't. So. Um, you want to make sure to stay in touch, right? Because what is it that donors complain about? Yes? Question, do you recommend that you send those uh, thank you online or a letter? Um, you know, we did both. So because we had, you know, 360 donors, I think up to a certain number, let me think. We may have sent email versions up to maybe like $25, and then everyone else we sent um, a printed letter, so whatever works best for you, it depends how many donors you have. I mean, of course, a letter is nice if you can do it. Um, so I think we all know donors hate it when you only come and talk to them when it's time to ask for money, so don't be that fundraiser. Um, you want to stay in touch with them, but now you have this great list of people who participated just on that one day, so you can send them emails just specific to them, and it could be the same copy as what you're sending out to your entire database, but say, hey, Big Give Donor, um, it's October and you donated on May, in May, guess what we're doing now with that money that we fundraised? So again, this is not uh, any different from normal fundraising, it's just a different mechanism. So I think that's all I had. So, questions? Yes? We did not. Um, we opted not to do that. Um, however, lots of, I know there were lots of other nonprofits. We had a breakfast series that was already scheduled for, I believe it was the morning of, so we made sure to make an announcement at the breakfast that morning saying, hey, um, Amplify Austin is going to start tonight. Make sure you donate. But we didn't have a special event. But it's, um, I know one of the most successful nonprofits in Austin was Hospice Austin, and I believe they had an event to kick it off, and that's how they jumped up so high right away. Mm-hmm. That first night. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think it depends on, you know, how many people are you reaching, you know, how many people are in your email database, and then if you're on social media, how many people, how many followers do you have, um, how many people like your page, and then, you know, here, the thing is that's, that's great about the Big Give is this, the entry point is $10, and Amplify Austin was $25, um, so I think it makes it more accessible for a number of donors, so maybe you want to do it that way, and maybe the dollar amount doesn't make good sense for you, but maybe a number of donors does. 
So, you know, there's no exact science to it, but you know, if how many people donate to you regularly throughout the year, maybe if you can get every one of them or a number something like that, you know, to those that number of people to participate, then that may be a good goal. Is that helpful? Kind of. No. <laughs> it's hard, you know, it's it's an experiment for everyone. I mean, we set a goal at Leadership Austin of $10,000, and I mean, we had no idea what it was gonna be like. Of course, this went across the whole, whole city, right? Because this, the city raised almost three times what the goal was. Um, of course, then they boosted it this year to four million, which is, woo, that's, that's pretty high, so <laughs> go, go Austin. But, um, you know, I, I think what I learned is that we can all expect to do better than we think we're gonna do. Because it is the first time and I know that the planning committee is working hard on making sure that it's being pushed out. I mean, I'm starting to hear it in lots of other places. So I, th I think it's going to be a good day. Yes. <laughs> so, so when you talk about fishing out to your database, it may be about new donors. Mm -hmm. uh, were there some strategies that people utilized? Did they create teams to help build new donors? Because I sort of feel like I don't want to raise money off of my current donors. I mean, they already will get. Mm -hmm. so anyway, yeah, that's that's tricky. I would I would caution you to say though, you're going to ask everybody who already donates to you. And yes, um, you know that's tough. Um, you know, everywhere I've I've worked, where I've done a mic micro giving campaign, we were generally speaking a younger donor set than what you're talking about, but. I mean, in some ways, I'm in a similar boat with you now being at the museum, so I, something I'm thinking a lot about, too. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, I don't know that there's an easy solution to that, and it may just be that you find the people who are um, more in that target audience of people who are active online and have them be almost ambassadors for you to help find those groups of people. And maybe it is about then, it's not about raising a lot of money because it sounds like you know, you're just wanting to build your email database and it's, it's doing whatever you can to promote your organization and then, oh, maybe you want to make a $10 gift because it's only $10. Um, yeah, that's, that's hard. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's part of it, and I don't know, John or Scott can tell me different, but I think also part of it is just to expose people to new ways of giving, even your existing donors, um, not just about the young people who already know how to give, you know, because they gave to some political campaign and made a $5 donation, um, or texted, you know, a gift to the Red Cross or something. So I think it's part of it, but I, I think it's, I don't know, it's a beautiful concept, and. You know, that's where I get sentimental about fundraising, is that, that we're all coming together um, to raise money for the entire community. Yes, we all personally benefit at our nonprofits, but I think it's, it's again, it's the rising tide lifts all boats, so see what we can do together. Mm-hmm. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, I've having done this a couple times before there was the the, you know, um, infrastructure of of a giving day. Um, you know, I had to sell it to these boards, and they were all like, "Yeah, I don't know. That sounds kind of like a crazy idea." So, I think once they see, because again, it, it's not, you know, those you, you saw the statistics, and in 2010 and 2012 at our at Art House and Leadership Austin, it wasn't. I mean, we raised like three thousand dollars. It wasn't a ton of money, but it was hundreds of new donors or hundreds of donors. Period. And I think it's just getting that kind of engagement. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's what it symbolizes. It's like, yes, I'm, it's $5, it's pretty low risk, or it's a $10 gift, that's, you know, that's maybe lunch one day, but I am demonstrating that I believe in what you're doing, whether they, the, that donor knows it or not, saying, yes, I support your nonprofit. To me, it's, a, it's more of a symbol. Yes? That's a very good question, um, and maybe, and, and, and John may be able to answer that. I will say personally from me, um, if you could tell by the timeline, I didn't stay <laughs> those nonprofits to see what happened in the next year, but John, did you wanna? Yeah, sure. Um, is this one on? Yeah, okay. Um, so to answer that question, what we've found generally across the country is that um, about 30 to 45% of givers on the day of the event are first time givers to an organization. So the vast majority of them are giving the minimum, and these are people who have connected through networks from your previous givers, uh, who have reached out and have jumped sort of aboard your mission to, to capitalize on targeting a particular hour or a particular prize, uh, because people are much, much more likely to give in those certain circumstances if they've never given before. To answer the, sec to answer the, the question based on that, we found about 90 to 95% of those givers then give the second year. So what, um, what a lot of the reports we've read after these events have shown, and, and the reason they grow sort of exponentially over a, over a period of time, and that's one way you have to think about this, is that it's not necessarily about this year. This year you may not raise a lot of money. This year is about planting seeds for next year, uh, where you will raise more money because you've had that opportunity to reach a new network, you've been exposed to tools to do that, and you're more equipped to do that moving forward in the future. But what these agencies have found is that, is that so, if, if somebody gives to Agency A uh, in 2012, or in 2011, let's say, um, they are going to give to Agency A again, if you stay in touch with them properly. And we're gonna be offering a workshop after this on how to continue to connect with those donors and, and to build them into sort of, you know, volunteers and to, and to kind of cultivate them further. But if you stay in touch with them, um, you're likely to get nine out of 10 of those will come back the next year and then they will also then give to organization B as well. So people are, 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 not giving, are not giving less, they're giving more, but they're spreading it out across a number of agencies. So you get to, so some cities who have done this for a while, like Dallas, for example, will have a much larger percentage of their givers give to four or five organizations than a city like Austin did, who had maybe 20% of their givers gave to more than one organization the first year, but they're expecting that number to grow, which is why that four million mark has come up from what their target goal was a million the first year. Uh, and this is sort of happening universally kind of across the board, if that helps. Um, sorry, how do you, how you know if you have a matching Mm. So on your profile, there was a, and we didn't, initially when you, when you filled it out, there, I don't think anybody actually filled this section out because it was really early on, but there's a section you can put there are matching funds available. And you can put yes and you can put an amount in that, in that category. So that'll immediately tell people that there are matching funds available. Um, but, in, but in general too, um, 
The bulk of people who are going to give to your organization are going to find it through your embedded link. So they're going to find it through your Facebook, through your Twitter, through your social media accounts, through your email address, I mean, through your email contacts. And in those, there's more information that's also attached to it. So you're, you're saying within that post, hey, help us give by 5 o'clock because one of our board members is putting in a $2,500 match. So they're not, there are very few people who are just going to log onto the website and scroll through a list of 250 organizations, find you, and give. I mean, that, that is a possibility. People do it. But, but the vast majority of them are going to follow sort of the, the rabbit hole that you kind of lead them down to it. So they're going to they're follow you through Facebook, and they're going to link to it that direction. Or they're going to see you posted on us, and they're going to link to it that direction. Or they're going to see um, your organization posted on uh, somebody who is an employee or a donor of your organization. They're going to see it there, and they're going to follow it that way. And that's why it's very important to sort of do the all hands on deck. I mean, really, everybody on your staff needs to be putting something out because they all have social networks as well. So even if you have 150 followers or 78 followers on Facebook, uh, you have staff members who potentially have more. Or you have staff members who have family who have more. And so it's, it's about capitalizing on, the, on that, social, that social experiment of, of, of getting people to sort of spread the word and not just immediately asking for one, one giver. Yes, we have already started to meet with um, different media outlets. So we're doing, we're doing social media plugs, but we're also going to be doing on-air interviews. We're going to be doing billboards once it gets closer to. We haven't started that process yet. We're going to be doing stuff on all of the major news networks, um, public radio, KLRN. Um, and then in addition to that, we're doing, you know, KRTU is going to be doing an on-air interview. We're doing on-air interviews on 4, 5, and, you know, WAI, those kinds of things. Radio spots. So, so we will be advertising. Yeah, absolutely. So when you log on that first home page, we'll have a multi-gift platform. And I think it's up to 15 agencies that you can give to at one point. Um, or you can then go over to the leaderboard and individually scroll down. And, I, and, and to add on to that, I had an email this past week. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember what organization this came from. But um, they, they, they were wondering, you know, well, what, is there a disadvantage to organizations that start with an S or a T or a W that are further down that <laughs> list? Um, and, 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 and it looks like that now because everybody's sort of listed alphabetically. But uh, the way it's going to work is that the leaderboard is dynamic. So as your organization raises money, you move further, and further up that leaderboard, for, uh, up and down the leaderboard. So if you're targeting a particular time period and you have a lot of people who are giving at, say, 11 AM, you're going to be way up in that leaderboard, which is going to give you a lot more exposure when people come in. And that enables you to capitalize on that sort of campaign, which is why it's important to not just be a passive participant and to actively pick time periods that will help you raise money and raise new donors, because that raises your, your, your profile essentially on the website. And two, you can do a search function. So you can immediately search for somebody on the website, on the site as well. And three, there's also a group function. So we're going to be grouping organizations based on uh, their category type. And so you'll be able to find them through those subsets as well. It'll, it, the search function works like it works on the back end right now, which means if I type in, say, um, uh, I don't know, um, the children, it'll bring up anything within that category. Yeah, in the title. Yeah, there are questions all over. Yes. No, not at all. They can find you through the regular search function just by typing in your name, if that's what you're asking. Um, they can find you through your stuff that you're posting. So your category is not necessarily important in terms of, I guess, in terms of them being able to locate you, if that's what you're asking. So with the email, do we, I, I guess, it, is it a good idea to say, look for our organization under X category? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's definitely going to help. but. But I mean, I don't think that's the way most people primarily find it. If, if they're going to, because you're also going to have the email and embedded link. 
and they'll, they'll just connect straight to your profile, your user profile through that. So I mean, that, that'll be a more direct route than having them go back and in, instructing them to go back into the website and search for you, if that makes sense. Because your, your, yours will just connect you straight to your, pa your page and there'll be a give function right there. Does that, does that, does that help? Oh, uh, nationally? Yeah, that's a great question. That's, it's, um, and I don't have any direct numbers to that because it's radically different depending on your type of nonprofit agency. For example, animal nonprofit agencies tend to have a lot more followers because it's easy to follow a group that's posting cute pictures of animals than it is <laughs> ra relative to you know, somebody who's posting something on, you know, something much more, I mean, I mean something in a much different context. So it, there are some kinds of organizations that lend themselves to social media better up front. Um, in San Antonio, of the organizations that we have, I would say that the average is around 250, and that's scaled up, actually, 250 followers on Facebook, between 250 and, between, somewhere between 250 and like 450 is right where that, the averages, I would say, for the agencies participating in the Big Give. There are agencies that have a significantly larger number than that, that are, that are scaling that number up. And then there are a lot of agencies that have numbers in the 100s, high, high, high like, you know, 99, 98 kind of number. Um, so, uh, and so like what Jennifer was saying is it's not, I mean, it's, it's, it's about identifying who you, who you do have and basing your target goal off of that amount. So if you're an organization that has 8,000 followers, um, a couple things. One, the way it works is that if you have 8,000 followers, you, you very easily could have a lot of interaction, but it's much more likely that if you're an organization that has 100 people, that you're gonna have a much higher percentage of those people actively engaged in what you're doing on Facebook or Twitter or any other site because they have obviously sought you out. Uh, and, and they're your first sort of, they're, they're your first they're the first wave of people who are joining you, and the first wave always tend to be more active because they, they're actively participating in you. So you have the built-in advantage that you can, you can connect with all, you can expect a higher percentage of those people to participate and those people to give than say an organization that has 15,000 followers. Um, uh, and then on that, so, uh, so the number isn't necessarily indicative of how well you're going to perform. Like I, I would ask you, how big was Leadership Austin compared to some of these other organizations? You know, I mean, our budget was not, I mean, our budget was, 700,000, so we're not a, wasn't a huge organization. Now, because 35 years of Leadership Austin classes, we had an Im, kind of embedded yeah. Facebook follower group. I don't know, we probably had a couple thousand Facebook followers. But um, that was worked more, and again, this is, this is back to the example, it's gonna vary by nonprofit by nonprofit. What I did at Leadership Austin isn't gonna work here. Um, and that was because we were able to play up on peer-to-peer -peer fundraising which I don't really have that at the museum. So again, you have to just think about how, what is the current dynamic you have with your current donors? How do they maybe, do they work with each other or are they also active in their own communities that they can reach out for you? Because the reason why crowdfunding or micro giving works is because it goes viral, right? And this is why we're all doing it together in 24 hours because all the buzz that's gonna get generated because of all the press um, everyone's gonna be like, oh yeah, I've heard about that big give. Oh yeah, that organization, I really like them. I didn't realize they're a nonprofit and they're participating. So it's just, it's gonna vary. Yeah, and on that, so there were, there were roughly, I think 20, 20 to 25,000 unique donors on Amplify Austin's first year. So if we expect a similar number to that, I mean, so those are sort of the realm that you're looking at. Not all those people gave to one organization, many of them gave to multiple organizations, but um, it's not like you're having the city of, you know, two, two million people giving on the day of the event at first. You know, in years down the road, those numbers obviously increase. Uh, and that's one of the advantages to being one of the first, like the first organizations involved in the first year is that it increases your likelihood of visibility later on. Um, so I don't know if that helps. And, and yeah, so, I mean, I've seen organizations, like as we've looked at this all around the country, there have been everything from churches to Planned Parenthoods to Goodwills to um, small organizations that have done extremely well. I, I would encourage you to go use, if you haven't looked at the toolkit yet, there's an article in there called, under helpful links, it's called The Permanent Disruption of Social Media. And it follows two organizations in Give to the Max Day 
uh, Washington, D.C., both relatively small organizations, and how they utilized social media in their giving day events as well. And they weren't organizations that could piggyback off of peer-to-peer, -peer, so they did it in a slightly different manner and were both very successful. Um, and as you were talking, it was making me, as you were just speaking, it was making me think, one other thing I'll put on the toolkit is some link outs to other previous uh, events. And it might be a good idea if you have a couple minutes to go through and find organizations that are like yours and maybe reach out to them via email and see what they did to capitalize. So if you are an organization that, um, I don't know, that works with the homeless, like see what other homeless organizations have done. And it's difficult for me, I mean, because there have been hundreds of these. It's difficult for me to pinpoint exactly within every single spectrum of what those organizations have been doing across the country, but there are a number of them that I'm sure have been successful. Yeah, sorry, there was one in the back first. That was... Is the leaderboard going to, for each organization, track dollars and dollars spent on each organization? Or is it going to be the number of donations? So if you set a goal that I want to have 100 donations versus I don't really care about how many I raise, are you going to be able to get kind of um, that information and be able to get it out for everybody? Yeah, and, it, and, it, and it'll track in real time. So it should, it should update, you know, within several seconds. It should be a constant update. So. On the main leaderboard, you, in the main leaderboard, you'll see two columns for, uh, yeah, for one for money and then one for unique donors. Yes. How do you get the toolkit? So the toolkit is on the website right now. If you just go to thebiggivesa.org, and then up at the top bar, there's a there's a section that says toolkit, and on that we'll be housing every single one of the workshops, all the powerpoints. If you want to go back, Kimbia, the platform we're using on the back end, has also done a number of workshops and. And, and webinars, and we will, those, you have access to all of those on there as well. Um, and then there are sample email, to, and we'll be updating that continuously, but there are sample, right now there's I think seven different things. There's a, a communications day plan, there's a checklist, there are, um, there are sample tweets and Facebook posts for you to start putting out. There's e e email, e-blast sort of templates, PSA templates, um, op-ed templates if you, wanna, if you wanna get into a paper. Those kinds of things, uh, we're including all of that, and then we're also going to start including like ideas behind how to run a successful day of event, because we've had about 50, 50 plus agencies say that they're interested in ho hosting something on the day of. Um, and then we will, in, in supporting of those sorts of things, especially if you have a particular time period that you're wanting to go after money, let us know, because we'll be posting that on our events section on the website as well. And then we have a team of about 25 people who will be going to all of these different events and will be covering you live through social media. Um, and so if you have a particular target at a certain hour, like it, let us know, we can make sure to have someone there at that point. Okay, that makes sense. No, not right now. There's not a comment section built in. Um, I can ask about that. I, because they're trying to do this with 100 different cities, That they have a pretty standard format. Um, so it's not super customizable. That's something we can definitely look into in future years. But we can, we can brainstorm and see if there's a way maybe get around that. Yes. Yeah, I, I was going to go ahead. I'll go ahead and add a link on the toolkit section to some of those cities, some of the ones that have been most successful, and that'll have the largest number of agencies that have participated. And the agencies yes, there will be agencies listed on their leaderboard, so you can go through and and find them. So, like, I'll I'll, I'll definitely link North Texas. They had 1,200 agencies participate last year. Um, Minnesota had I think like 800 or something. Um, Seattle's had a number, uh, and those are some. Of, those are like the really the big three: Colorado. Um, Columbus, Coastal Bend, those are, those are all some of the largest uh, raisers. So. And I, w I would recommend um, going to, I just saw the email last week that they're going to, Kimbia or, is doing the uh, mm -hmm. webinars um, because they do a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, giving days. So that's a good resource. I don't know if 
I guess they're webinars in yeah. person. But I know that we, we had those in Austin, and that was really helpful because the person who was giving it had been the person who'd done it in other cities. So um, that was a good resource. We've had, yeah, we've, had, um, we've had some agencies that have told us that they, they participated in the online ones and that they're extremely useful because these are people who are, I mean, this is what they do nationally. Like they go to these kinds of things and, and present stuff on, on, on group fundraising. And so if you can't make them, we've been sending those emails out as they've been coming around, but if you can't make them, once again, those will be on the website. So you can go back to the toolkit and, and locate them that way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, since you raised $25,000 last year with Leadership Austin, mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it was a it was a pretty unique model that was awesome, and I'm sad I can't do it here. But <laughs> um, and if if only I don't think Leadership San Antonio is a 501c3 because otherwise I'd give them the idea. But um, what happened is so there were these individual fundraising pages. So we had the essential class, which is your the like the Leadership San Antonio class, and then there was a young professional group. So there were 35 class pages for the essential class. There were, had been seven or eight years of emerged classes, so about 40 pages. And then what we did is that we went through each of the class rosters, there's about 50 plus people in each class, and identified someone who could be the captain. Now, of course, with that many classes, we didn't actually get someone for every, from every class to participate, but we got probably about a dozen or so. And then once we secured that person to be the class captain, then I had a toolkit that I had set, had prepared for them and say, here are the emails that you can send out the day before, um, here's some information. And then what we did is, I mean, we were a small staff, probably about seven people, I think. Um, and I assigned staff to certain classes, because you know I couldn't alone manage all 40, um, so that they could communicate with their people and say, hey, how's it going? Hey, here's, here's an update that you can push out, you know, basically copy and paste this email, send it to the class. Um, and that's how that works. So what ended up happening, because they were competing against each other, these really competitive people, that they said, oh, we're getting close. And then some people, that's why there were you know, 379 gifts, but there were actually 365 donors, because some people gave more than once to push their class over the top, which is great. Um, but there weren't any matches. There, weren't, there were no matching gifts. A couple of people gave you know, maybe $1,000. So that's the great thing. You'll find that. Even here, where the minimum gift is $10, some people are going to give you a lot more than $10. You're, you'll get a number of $100 gifts. So that's how those totals raised up. I don't know. I guess you can do the math and figure out what the average gift was, but obviously it's more than $25. But um, I don't know. I would love to get a match. I think it, that's a great way to do it, too. Yes? So logistically, to set up the competition, mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, I don't think there's going to be individual fundraising pages, are there, John? No, and that's because we're doing it this year with that, with the whole, with the whole national group. Um, and, and in future years, that's going to be a possibility because we're going to be switching up formats. This year, we went with this group because they are kicking back $25 million, is what they've told us, to all of the cities that are participating, which will mean another 250000 in matching funds coming to agencies in San Antonio if that's the number they hit. So that was, the, that was sort of part of the trade-off for us in, in terms of do we go with something a little more dynamic for this first year or something that provides a little more funding support? Um, and that was, so that, that, that's kind of where we fell. But you can definitely do that. I mean, you can keep track of it. You can figure out maybe a way to keep track of it internally in your office um, mm -hmm. when people give. Yeah, I mean, we ended up so. keeping track of it internally, too. Yes, people were giving, but sometimes they would give to the wrong page or they'd give to the main Leadership Austin page instead of giving to their class. And I know that we were able to download basically a spreadsheet in real time that had more details about every gift. And it was manual, but again, it's only 24 hours, so you can suffer for you know, for that one day. But we went through and I kind of made sure that everyone was classed in the right place. So there are ways to do it just in-house 
and track. And, and I'll I'll check on that Excel sheet. I mean, I think okay. that's the same way. We'll, I think that's the same way we have it, so that you can you can check that as well. Uh, but I'll double check and, and let you know. Okay. Yes. be really that on that front page, there'll be a multi-gift platform. So as so, soon as someone types in the biggivesa.org, they will go, uh, they'll see a big, a big thing that allows them to give to multiple organizations. And then you'll just click over to the leaderboard and the only difference is gonna be that it's gonna have a listing of the awards that are coming up at the time. Um, we don't have that now, it's just following the social media tracker right now. And then those organizations will be moving up and down. So really it's not, it's not going to be any different than what you really kind of see. I'll check with Kimbia to see if we can get something from previous years at a different organization so that we could potentially send that out. Um, because that's, that's a good question, yeah. Uh, but but I, I mean, it, it shouldn't be difficult to navigate. It should look exactly like it looks right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they can get in touch with Kimbia, they can get in touch with us. If there's, if there's issues, you can, I mean, that, that's what we have people prepared to do, so. That's a great question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'll, I'll, I'll check that and let you know. I, I can t oh, sorry. The question was um, whether or not the, the amount that's the amount that's on the board is the amount that'll show up on the leaderboard. Is it the whole amount before deductions, or is it the amount after deductions? I, um, I can tell you what we did in Austin. Okay. Um, the amount that was on the leaderboard during the day was the actual amount that people had donated, and then. After the 24-hour period closed, then we got a report from the Austin Area Foundation that said, this is the total number of gifts that we received towards your organization, and here are the fees. Now, the good news, and again, I don't know, it sounds great, there's Kimbia's giving this match, is that there were other matches. Um, the University Federal Credit Union was a big sponsor of the day, and kind of these other little matches here that got spread across all of the nonprofits ended up covering the fees. So that was nice. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, so the Kimbia match, they have what they've told us so far, and this has been subject to change because they're going to be releasing the final at the start of April. But what they've told us so far is that the anticipation is 25 million na nationwide. 250,000 essentially matching at each, uh, or about roughly about that. That's, that's been the breakdown. They haven't told us exactly how that match works, but if it's an even match, that's what we're going to be looking at, um, which would then kick back about a little under, well, about $1,000 at this point to each participating agency. Um, what ha the way it works there, and I don't know if this will be similar, but again, with UFCU being a sponsor, they did, I think, $100,000. It was based on how many dollars raised, so it got spread evenly to every dollar that was donated. So it ended up, you know, because we, instead of doing 1 million, we did 2.8 million, whatever that proportion is, if you spread that $100,000 evenly. Yeah, absolutely. And then to answer your other question about prizes right now, we will have all of the hourly prizes. Those are already set. So there will be $1,000 hourly prizes going on consistently. Then there's the Kronkowski match, and we're anticipating, we're still in the middle of fundraising, but we're anticipating having sort of what Kronkowski's doing, but having it accessible to all organizations, so like a, a final day prize for small budget, medium budget, large budget organizations. And so, and, and with those thousand dollar prizes, somebody asked me this at a, at a previous meeting, like how can an organization that's smaller, you know, even dream to compete with these large organizations who have an entire staff dedicated to this, once you win one of those hourly prizes, you're not qualified to win another one. So um, it, gives, it gives everybody an opportunity to, to really kind of pick their target time and go for it. Yes. Will you have any recommendations about how to manage this thing in the middle of the night when most people have to be sleeping? Yeah, absolutely. So your social media, 
a way to manage that, Jennifer brought up, is a great, a great idea. Is I would look into, it's a free, there are free things like TweetDeck or uh, Hootsuite. They're very easy to use. You, you, know, you just set up an account and you link your social media account to them. Um, and then you can schedule posts and it does it in a number of ways. You can either, or Buffer is another really good one. You can either pick the time that you want the post to go out. So you can write everything, say, at 4 p.m. The, next, the day before and then have it scheduled to go out at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Um, Yeah. I would put a link to your page. Mm -hmm. You'll have a unique URL. You want always to link to your page. We're doing great. Woohoo! Go donate. Here's yeah, yeah. You don't. Yeah, you don't want necessarily <laughs> want to encourage people to give to. Obviously, like, I mean, yeah, exactly. Your page. If you want them to give to you at a particular <laughs> hour, link them to your. Make it as easy as possible for them to give to you, and link them directly to your page. I can tell you, I stayed up till probably two or three in the morning. <laughs> I think I slept a couple hours, woke up, and just because it's adrenaline, it's the excitement. So. The the link for giving. Well, no, no, we'll be getting. You'll be getting an embeddable link prior to that. So we'll be getting that within the next several weeks when Kimia sends them out, and they should come to. If you're already approved, they should come directly. They should come directly to your account. Um, but that link for giving is not active until midnight. So they, they can't put anything in right now, essentially. And if we didn't say it, make sure you put something on your home page, like the Big Give oh, yeah. logo, and then it, the link will be to your unique URL. And, and that's all in the toolkit. We have, we have the logo in a bunch of different formats. We have a proud sponsor logo if you have a business that wants to match for your organization. Um, so they can have that as well to put on their website. Incur, incur, if you have people who give, and this is something we've seen, if you have, if you have a, a business that gives to your organization, encourage them to, to do a, like that's a great place to encourage them to do a match and encourage them to embed your link onto their website as well for the day of. You know, they could easily do that to support this organization through this, uh, through this effort. Yes. That will be evenly distributed dollar for dollar based on what you raise. Yeah. So if you don't raise any money, then yeah, you won't get any money from it. But if you raise, you raise a thousand dollars, you'll get a thousand dollars basically. Yeah. Well, that's what I mean. It, it could be a lot more. They could be doing it based on urban size. I mean, based on size of metropolitan area, because it would be to me that to me that that amount um, seems really unfair for us to be getting the exact same amount as a city that has 50 organizations participating. It doesn't make any sense. So. Um, we're one of the largest cities participating, and so I imagine that the amount, the amount is based on a match for each city to reach, and so we could be getting more than that. So I, I, don't, wanna, I, I, I don't want to speak about that a lot until I know more detail on their match. Um, I just know what we sort of have built up so far, and those are those prizes, and most of our prizes are not restricted to a match, so it's, it, it's exactly that, it's a prize. You, you, you win it for the hour, or you win it for the day of the event. It's not, um, well there is the Kronkowski one, um, if you are an agency that receives money from them, that one is just, I mean, you're only, only groups that can win it are groups that, are, that, groups that receive money from them, but our, all of ours are accessible to anybody. Yeah. Hourly and then collectively at the end. And we're working. We're. I mean, uh, that, and that's and that's just the base. We're, we're. We are now that we've got that covered. We're allowing organizations to be creative with their gifts, and so we will be releasing that information when we have more of those. So we're encouraging. So some of the city council members have offered to put money forward, um, and so they'll be giving money to organizations within their zip codes that they represent in their districts. So. Uh, there will be other creative matching opportunities that come up, or, or not necessarily matching, but prize opportunities that come up, and we're allowing companies, um, foundations, individuals who, who contribute to those to sort of determine the parameters, and we'll be very clear about all of those in emails. You, you will know exactly what the, fun, like what the opportunities are before the event.
Anyone any, else? Any other questions? Yes. To the nonprofit, okay. roughly not. Yeah, so I mean, well, I guess it's the same thing. They're nine out of ten of those are going to give to the, the, the giving day because they're giving to the nonprofit again on the next giving day. Okay, but do you have any uh, numbers on how many stay engaged with the nonprofit outside that giving? Day? That's very dependent upon what what we've seen is there there are some nonprofits that have very large a, a large number of active active people who are actively involved, and some that are very small. That it's difficult to find an average in that. That's fair to talk about because it's it's very dependent upon your organization's ability to stay in contact. Since that's outside of the realm of our our scope, I mean that's uh, I mean we're helping get, getting you all the information for them, and then it's sort of the nonprofit's job at that point to to continue forward. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so in Richmond, they did they did it, um, and all. So their restriction was that you had to receive money from the area foundation or the community foundation in the area to participate. But they hosted a big event, sort of where everybody was there. And, and in a sense, it's and in a sense, what you're asking is is it's similar to what we'll be doing at the night of at at the Briscoe where everybody's gonna be there and there's gonna be giving stations, so you're all technically actively participating with one another there uh, and contributing to the overarching effort. Um, so yeah, I think that's definitely a, a worthwhile strategy, you know, to have organizations that have strong relationships partner together. Any other questions? Well, great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, we want to thank Jennifer again for giving us the workshop. Nowcast for uh, filming and recording. Um, and the Oblate for having us all here. And thank you guys for coming out.